Our very special guest is Councilman Robert Carnegie from Brooklyn. Councilman, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. You played at St. John's University. Yes, sir. And I, re I remember uh, seeing you uh, at playing in the game with one of my friends, uh, Robert Johnson. We call him Clayton. Uh, you grew up in Queens. You were playing for Jackson High School, which is now Campus Magnet High School. Unfortunately. You were playing, and it was 1981, you were playing in a championship game against Alexander Hamilton High School. Alexander Hamilton High School had uh, Beetle Washington, the point guard, had Andre Sky Irving, this 5'10 kid that could jump to the top of the square and dunk. Was, was he 5'10? Because he seemed like he was way taller than that. Well, he I got, I he got up he, pretty high. Listen, I, I, I walked up to him and I looked down on him. Okay, and I'm 5'10 okay. and a half, so okay. I, I gave him 5'10. They had Jerry Ice Reynolds, Man. who played in the NBA for about seven years. Yes, sir. They had Carrie Scurry, who had a stint with the Knicks, and he played in the NBA. Yeah. Uh, and you guys had, I believe it was um, Vern Fleming. No, Vern. Vernon Moore. Vern Moore. George Allen. George Allen. And those guys filed out, and you found yourself in the championship <laughs> game as a freshman. Yes, sir. Yes. That must have been nerve-wracking. Yeah, I was almost as nervous then as I am in the studio today. But, you know, I, I think that prepared you for – your um, current position as councilman now, you were placed in a young age of 14 in the position and uh, that was pressure and you're in the pressure situation now. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we had um, a death here in New York City and it was attributed to an arrest, um, Eric Garner in Staten Island and the arrest was over selling Ill illegal cigarettes and well, Lucy's, uh, yeah. Lucy's, an unfortunate situation just mushroomed out of control to uh, we have a death and the family lost a husband, uh, a father, and uh, now the whole city is in the uproar. You know, uh, before I even broach the topic, I really want to um, send my condolences out to the Garner family. Um, I have no idea what the situation feels like to be in this. I can't even fathom. So uh, although I empathize, uh, the, the sister Alicia is, is actually a friend of mine. She lives in Bedford-Stuyvesant, where I represent. So it's it's kind of close, you know, being being a a, a black man yes. in the city of New York. You know, it, it kind of resonates uh, with me, not as a legislator, but just as a man first and foremost, and as a father of four uh, boys, uh, black boys in this city. Um, it, it makes you very concerned uh, when those that are responsible and who have been sworn to protect and serve, uh, and that doesn't happen. You know, it's it's a it, it sends a tremendous uh, concern throughout the city. And we also had another tragedy in the Housing Authority a couple of weeks ago. A where, girly. That's right. And and that was a, a, an accident. And uh, we, we, we should speak about that one also. But let's stay with uh, Eric Garner, and then we'll speak about uh, Mr. Gurley. Okay. Um, I saw several things go wrong. Uh, and if I could uh, make some suggestions, maybe you and I can uh, assist the police department, maybe we can get some of the police union uh, presidents to come and get involved with us. And what I would propose is that we go on a tour around the city and the schools and neighborhoods and we get actual police officers and the residents and the community together to talk about what do we do when we have an arrest situation. Because I, I look and see all too often, people are trying to try their cases in the streets, which leads to danger. If a police officer approaches you and you're innocent and you know you're innocent, I don't think that is the time to prove you're innocent. I think the time to prove you're innocent is in court with the legal proceedings. Rather than argue with the police and let it escalate and then maybe some onlookers may get involved who know you're innocent and people could get killed or hurt and things spiral out of control. I think. The way we have it, if, if we're sitting down and we, we come to some resolution where there's some control and you say, okay, you're going to be arrested, okay, I'm going to be arrested, I go in, and we're sorted out then. I think, I think um, it's funny that you bring that up. I've had the pleasure of sitting on uh, a lot of panels with uh, members of the CCRB, and, um, which is the Civilian Complaint Review, Bo Review Board. And one of the things they say is uh, to make sure that you get home or get to your destination safely, uh, which is to comply with the officers. Um, I think, though, there's a, there's a double standard that's happening. Um, you can be uh, um, arrested or placed under arrest or questioned without the level of re disrespect 
that some people experience in uh, characteristically in communities of color. Um, you know, I myself uh, publicly have said in my own district, I've been stopped uh, at least two times by police officers in my old, own district who didn't recognize me or for whatever reason. And, um, you know, with my family in the car, and there's a level of, uh, of, of respect that sometimes happened. In my cases, it didn't happen both times. Um, um, it, they were younger officers who, who didn't show any reverence uh, for me being with my family, not just as an elected official. And I think oftentimes it's hard to mitigate that as a man. Yeah. So, like, you, you're a man first. Sure, sure. Um, And so every time I'm on this panel, we have this discussion, and I always explain, you know, from my personal experience, what it was like uh, with my children in the background who— um, have a certain level of reverence for me as their dad, as somebody who works hard, and then to see uh, an officer uh, and to some degree be demeaning, um, um, it's hard to mitigate that as, as a man first. So I, don't, I, I can't imagine what happened in other situations. I know in the Ghana situation, um, he had said that you know, he, he, he was fed up with um, what he uh, articulated as harassment of the police, and he just wasn't going to have it that day. So I don't know what had happened prior to that with those same officers right. that got him to that point, but he really had made a declarative statement that he was not going to uh, uh, be, he didn't want to be harassed that day and he wanted to be left alone. Um, I don't know, you, you know, you know, obviously there's rights as an officer that you have to comply with an officer, but to some degree people said that it looked as though from the video that he actually was compliant. Yeah, I with, saw with, it. With at, his hands being one, in the air. At one um, point, yeah. Yeah, at one point he looked, he looked yeah. compliant. So there's a, there's a lot of controversy with that particular yeah. video. Uh, different than Ferguson, uh, different than Gurley, different than other situations. One is, the one determining factor this time was, there was video on at all time. Right? right. We haven't had that uh, in the past to some degree. So uh, a lot of people are now saying, did my eyes actually deceive me? What I saw was someone literally choked to death, someone who had between 11 and 14 times said, I can't breathe. Uh, where's the humanity for someone who you're subduing, who is clearly subdued and says that they can no longer breathe? Right. When do you stop applying a chokehold or whatever hold they want to call it? When, at what point? Yeah, it looked like he was on his back at that he point. He was on yeah. his back. At least two officers had their knee in their back, one had his knee on his head, and he was still in the chokehold. So at which point have you yeah. subdued the person enough to conduct your arrest. And I think uh, that that therein lies some departmental issues. They've already said that there'll be an, a depart, departmental although there was, yeah, there's a, a departmental investigation that's gonna be gonna take place, the police commission has said that. And there's also a federal investigation, civil rights investigation that's taking place simultaneously. So what I'm telling people as they protest is, this is far from over. So, right. so, so although, and characteristically, the federal government has had to intercede on civil rights cases across the country. For whatever reason, uh, cities and states have not stood up to the challenge of what's on the books, and the feds have to come in and do that. So there is another course of action and another recourse for that. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm not telling people to calm down because I, you know, I don't have... No, we're uh, just telling them, please don't tear up anything and please protest uh, and, and have his memory... Uh, remember, let's remember him as a man who died and we feel unjustly and let's not protest and tear things up. Let's protest in a reasonable manner as Dr. King would have protest. Well, there's two things protest. in that. One is, one is I'm suggesting, um, as many have suggested, that if we want to uh, assume a role in this country as people of color of any prominence is going to be through economic development. So you don't want to destroy your economic engines, which to some degree uh, in communities like ours are small businesses. So I've approached it from that standpoint. So I'm not telling mm -hmm. people, you know, don't you, you, you know, you don't want the wrong result. Right. When I think about my community, I think about the corridor along Broadway, which during the blackouts in the 70s, there was a lot of looting and crime. And it took 30 years to revitalize that stretch of commercial thoroughfare. Um, so we, we talk about Broadway in Brooklyn, Broadway in Brooklyn, the Broadway along the L line, yeah. along the train line. Um, there, it was a booming kind of almost a metropolis and, 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 a, and a central location for businesses. When the blackouts took place and there was looting and, and all kind of uh, um, disorderly conduct and behavior and destruction of those businesses, it literally took 30 years to rebuild those businesses. So if we say, like some other communities, we're going to make our mark by a strong, solid economic development, you can't destroy your economic development engines. Right. And I think people understand that. So whereas the difference in, in, in Ferguson is people were so frustrated, no one was standing there saying to them, uh, don't loot your businesses because those are your economic drivers and your economic indicators, and they're what determine uh, what comes out of a community. 
Um, we're saying that. We're saying yeah. I'm, I'm the chair of small business for the New York City Council, and I'm saying that one of the best things to do is to invigorate your small businesses to be to make a difference economically. Um, th- that's what this country understands. So we have to understand that as well. Now, now you mentioned being stopped by the police and um, uh, not being uh, treated the way you should be treated mm-hmm. as an adult and a man. Absolutely. Uh, another suggestion I would make, I would make it to uh, Police Commissioner Bratton, that we have community leaders go in and speak to the rookies in the police academy. Absolutely. Speak to them how uh, in a way that we, how we want to be treated, who we are as a community, and the job that they're taking, because many of the children come in, not say children, they're young adults, come in from Long Island and Westchester, and some of them don't have experiences with people of color and working in these neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. They, they've lived in mommy and daddy's houses all their life. They had the dog. They had the picket fences. They have everything else. And now they're thrust in this community, and they're walking around, and, and they're lost. Well, you can't, you can't police out of fear. Right. So if if you're fearful that you're working in a community that's unsafe, uh, that sends a trigger. If you're fearful that you're working in a community that doesn't have uh, 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 a control of their circumstances or a willingness to participate. You know, so what I understand about about the police, I have family members that are police officers, uh, men and women. And what I understand is as a police officer, you see 99 percent of the time, the one percent of the bad element in any community. So if you could imagine that. So 99% of the time, you're encountering the 1%, because there's only 1% right. of communities of color, of communities across the country right. that are bad apples. But 99% of your day is spent dealing with those bad apples. So I understand how that could negatively impact or shape your vision of what a community is. I say you should get, in, if, you're, if you're required to police in, per, in particular districts, you should be required to participate in other things outside of just policing. So you should have to go to the PAL and work with the young people and see the families that bring their kids to the PAL. You should have to attend the church service or, 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 or some type of social gathering that lets you get a bigger understanding of what community you're serving. Just think about it. 99% yeah. of the time, you deal with the 1%, 1%. Yeah. that's the bad apples. It would certainly, potentially, uh, negatively impact your vision of a community. So you should be required as part of your training to participate in either church service or social gathering or something that integrates you with the community. When um, in, in my district, a lot of times we'll have cops versus kids basketball games. That's an opportunity to see kids um, who are on their way to college, yes, yes. who are, are, are involved in um, uh, 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 social programming and all kind of different things and see their families. It gives you a different understanding and vision. So those are just the simple things you can do. One of the things I was really excited about was the fact that uh, Chief Banks was going to be the first dep. Now, obviously, we know that that whole thing fell apart, and we're still trying to get answers to how that happened. But Chief Banks was building in a community component to the training that happened. So all of the training that goes down at at the police academy, they were now going to incorporate regular citizens who were, you know, who so had, just who had it, been we're suggesting just what he you're was suggesting. going to do. Right. Yeah. So we, we need to make sure that that still happens, although we have uh, uh, First Deputy Tucker, Tucker yeah. who, who I have a great reverence for, and I think he'll, he'll do a great job. We need to revisit some of the ideas um, uh, that were already on the table that would help with police community uh, relations. Unfortunately, we're, we've run out of time. Really? But we we gotta have to have you come back because there's so many to. other topics that we needed to discuss, and we have to have you come back soon. I would love that. Um, you've been listening to Reaching Out. I'm Gregory Floyd, President of Local 237 Teamsters. Our very special guest is Councilman Robert Carnegie. Uh, remember that name, Councilman Robert Carnegie. Uh, he took over the seat for the famous uh, Al Van, who was an assemblyman for many many years and a councilman for about eight years. And you're going to remember his name because you're going to hear a lot about this young man in politics. And I want you all to remember that he was on Reaching Out and he's going to be back. 